Well, I believe that that's your really heart's desire, or you wouldn't be in church today. I want to be like Jesus. Well, coming to church helps us be like Jesus, doesn't it? You quit coming to church and you'll become more like the world. Come to church, that helps us be like Jesus. God bless you for being here today. Welcome our visitors. I want you to feel right at home. And everybody, join me in Psalms 71. And while you're finding that, the new directory, thanks to Juanita, is finished and done. And if we didn't put one in your hand, there's some out there on the table, I believe, or out there in the foyer someplace. Help yourself to one of them. And uh, got the current information in it. You uh, throw the other ones away, keep this one, if you can do that. Psalm 71, in thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. Never let me be confounded. Always help me keep my wits about me. Don't let me lose my way, Lord. Let me never be put to confusion. I read this week an ex-Google employee said that five out of six things posted on the internet is false. We are surrounded by lies. Oh God, don't let me be misled. Don't let me be put to confusion. I thought of that old song I'm telling on myself. Oh Lord, please don't let me be misunderstood. <laughs> Father, we bow. It's your word, it's your day, it's your time. We are in your house. Use your word to speak to us in a very powerful way today because, Lord, we need to hear from you. Oh. And uh, we just bow before you, Lord, and say, we need help. Help to hear, help to preach, help to receive the engrafted word that's able to save our soul. We pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. This past spring, I stopped at Valley Nursery, the nursery there outside of Young Harris on the way to Blairsville, to pick up some garden plants for what he had. And I was the only one there other than the owner, pulled in my little red pickup there. And I, as my habit is, I always lock the doors. No matter where I go, I always lock the doors. I don't have automatic door locks, I have a key and a button. <laughs> so I locked it, went and got a flat of garden vegetables. I was all over the place, you know, picking out a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of that, and uh, set it down. No, I put that first flat in the trunk and went and got another one. Come back, paid him for it, and then I reached in my pocket and I didn't have my truck key. <laughs> so I immediately went over and peered through my tinted windows and the key was not in the ignition. So I knew I have lost my key. I've laid it down someplace. So I started backtracking and I told the owner, I said, I've laid my key down someplace, you know, I've done it before, I've done it again, here we go. So I started backtracking through the greenhouses where I had been and at each one of these sections, the tomatoes and the peppers and, and eggplant and whatever he had, you know, and everywhere I'd stopped and I'm looking for a key, he's got these wire tables and I'm thinking, well that key could have fell through that table, it's down on the ground. So I'm not only looking in the little gravel path, but I'm looking in the flats and I'm thinking okay I was over here and I was over there and I'm thinking I'm gonna find it right here and I can't find it I went back to the truck I retraced my stuff I went back to where I the table where I had set it down to pay my I'm not in full-blown panic yet but I'm getting real close <laughs> and I walked around and walked around and I know I had been back in those greenhouses three times and I finally a one more time back to the truck and I'm telling myself, it's here, because I drove here. Now, that truck is sitting right here, so I know that key is on the premises. So it, it's not in my pocket, it's not in my shirt pocket, it's laying here someplace, and I happened, 
as I'm looking through the glass on the door, thinking, is it on the seat? Is it in the floorboard? Where is it? I happen to look down, and there was the key stuck in the door in the lock, right where I left it. And I was so glad I was the only customer there. Nobody could see me other than the owner, and he knows I'm crazy anyway, but... You know, I'm like, thank you, Jesus. That which was lost is found. Hallelujah, throw a party. <laughs> Some of you laugh because you've done it too. You've, you've done something so foolish, so, so mindless at the time that you think, oh, am I the only one out there doing this kind of stuff? We make mistakes because we get in a hurry. And we're not really concentrating what we're doing. We're just kind of like autopilot. We're doing it because we've done it before, but we're leaving some stuff out and we don't realize it till the end. And we make mistakes and say, now where did I put that? I just had it in my hand. Where did I, where did I put it? We make mistakes because out of we are just curious people and sometimes we do things we probably shouldn't do. Like what if I hit it one more time with a whole lot more force? <laughs> We make mistakes because of just plain ignorance. We just don't know any better. And we make mistakes. We're wrong. We don't know it, but we find out. <laughs> Sometimes we make mistakes because of bad timing. we just at the wrong place at the wrong time, and it just really goes wrong for us because it's wrong. Talked with my cousin's husband. He retired not too long ago from the airline industry. And he told me about a month ago, he said, Mark, think about all those people who just finished up flight school to go into the airline industry. They just finished this early spring only to find that the airline industry has crashed and there is no jobs whatsoever. And he said that it's going to probably take several years at least for the airline industry to ever get close to where it was. He said, you talk about being in the wrong vocation at the wrong time when a number of airlines have just bottomed out and they're going to go away. You talk about bad timing to go into flight school and come out this spring. <laughs> wow, and they said, boy, wasn't that a mistake. Well, all of us have got some stories like that. We've made mistakes along the way, and we say, if I would have known then what I know now, <laughs> I would have become a meat cutter, <laughs> you know? <laughs> psalm 71 is assumed to be a psalm of David late in life. He's, the, he's now older, he's wiser, he's a senior statesman, and he's just dripping with knowledge. Verse 9, he refers to old age. Verse 18, he said, now also when I'm old and what? You know, we, we read of David early on, he's kind of red-headed. We get the idea he's ruddy, and he's, which means red. And, and now it's not red anymore, it's gray. He has got some years under his belt. But he writes in verse 1, Lord, I put my trust in you, and I'm going to pray and ask you, help me to never be put to confusion. That word confusion in the King James, if you've got an NIV, it is the word shame. But in the original text, it means that, Lord, I don't want to be ever do something to shame myself or shame my family or shame the church. I don't want to end up blushing because of my actions or be confounded or disappointed by something I've done or something I've said. Lord, help me to never lose my way. Lord, I've lived too long to start making these kind of mistakes. Keep me from making a mess out of my life at my age now. What will they say about me down at the senior center? <laughs> now, for those of you that go around looking for your glasses and they're already on your head, or you find yourself putting the milk in the microwave and your cup of coffee in the refrigerator. <laughs> or you go out into the world and all of a sudden you know somebody's kind of looking at you and snickering and you realize you never looked in the mirror. <laughs> and you should have. Yeah. Or you put supper in the oven but you forgot to turn it on. If you find yourself doing stuff like that, Psalm 71 might be just for you. <laughs> oh Lord, Help me not to be confounded or confused. Amen. 
David is not praying this out of vain glory or an ego that's just bent out of shape that he's scared to death that somebody might realize he made a mistake. He's praying this from a heart that he's sincere. Lord, keep my feet on the path of righteousness. Lord, keep me in the center of your will. Lord, keep me following you. Keep my eyes open, my ears open to what the Spirit and the Bride is saying. Lord, I don't want to get it wrong. I've got too many years invested in this. I don't want to mess up now. I don't want to blow it. As Paul wrote, I don't, when I have preached to others that I might be a shipwreck myself. Now, folks, let me tell you, God delights in guiding His children. And that is a prayer that the Lord will always answer. You start praying, Lord, keep my feet on your straight and narrow path, and you keep my heart soft and tender. God will answer that prayer. He will always answer that prayer. He's not playing hide and go seek either. Jeremiah 33, he says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Remember James? James chapter 1, what did he say? If any man lack wisdom, let him look up Wikipedia, Google it. No, he said, call to me and ask. And I will give and I will not rebuke anybody. I giveth liberally and upbraideth not. But I love Proverbs 1, 23. He said, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. So... Here we are in Psalm 71, and he's praying that, and he doesn't just pray there. There's a number of verses here in this chapter. We're going to look at some of the things that he includes in this, and it's not just good advice for elderly people. This is good for advice for anybody at any age. So don't check out and say, well, this is just for the old folks today. No, it's for all of us. So stay with me. What does he say in verse 2? He said, I'm going to trust the Lord for my deliverance. Look at that. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Verse 4, deliver me, O my God. That's one of the hardest, but maybe the greatest responses for a believer to learn in their life is that we quit trying to handle these kind of problems ourselves. Because human nature is that when you've got an enemy or I've got an enemy, flesh wants to rise up and say, I can handle that one. I can take care of that. Let me, let me tell you how I'm going to do. They did this to me. This is what I'm going to do to them. We're going to repay them evil for evil. That's just the flesh rising up saying, let me at them. I want to do it. I want to pound the flesh. I want justice done. I don't want to wait on the court system. I don't want to wait on, on God. God, he's full of mercy. And I'm not. <laughs> And I want them to pay. And matter of fact, I want them to pay double. It's called tit for tat. I want them to really know how much they hurt me. And yet, you've read Romans 12. What does it say? Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place to God. Now that's hard to do. When your heart's hot and your attitude is wrong and your blood pressure's up and the veins are sticking out of your neck and you're mad... And you want justice? Paul wrote in Romans there at the end of the chapter, be not overcome of evil. Don't let it get the best of you. But overcome evil with what? Good. Good, yeah. That's the plan, isn't it? That's the plan right out of the Word of God. This is how we recompense people. We pray for those who despitefully use us, and we love our enemies, and we are good to those people who don't deserve it, you know why? Because we didn't deserve it either. <laughs> but in his mercy, he was good to us. David says here, I've been around the block before, and I'm going to let God take care of it now. There was a day when David would have rushed off to the battlefield, whatever it was, and he would have said, I can solve this. But David now says, Lord, I'm going to trust you to take this one. I'm going to give it to you. You deliver me. He was known as a warrior king. Solomon is going to reap the benefits of David beating back the enemies for years. And he won't have to go to war, but his, his daddy went to war constantly when he was the king so that it didn't have to be that way with his son. So David was used to making people pay. 
But at this age, he says, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to trust God to do this. Well, David had learned this early on. Take him as a youth taking on Goliath. If the, and, and that's just, you know, an epic story. But the truth is, it was really a sign for what he would have to live with the rest of his life. Giants. Everywhere he went. He, is, he traded in one giant for another one. One day it's not Goliath anymore. Now it's King Saul who wants his life and chasing him for 10 years of his life through the wilderness. Wanting to kill him. Put a bounty on his head and running around with thousands of troops trying to find one guy in the wilderness. And yet God protected him. And when he gets past that, then he becomes king eventually. And then he's taken on the Philistines and all the other countries around him. And then when he gets them all beat down, then it's his son. His own flesh and blood that's after him. If you turn over to chapter 69, look at verse 4. No, let's, let's go back to verse 3. I am weary, chapter 69, Psalms, verse 3. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dried. My eyes fail. While I wait for my God, they that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. Some of you say, well, according to that, I ain't got no enemies. <laughs> That's not what he's saying because at this point in time, he's now old and gray-headed. So he's got hair. But if you start counting hairs, he's got a lot of enemies. And yet he is saying, God, you're going to have to deal with him because I can't. Be careful in this area. If there's anywhere that people could mess up and get in trouble, it's when you start trying to take these problems on yourself. You need to give them to God and say, Lord, you're going to have to solve this for me because I can't. Because if I get into this, I'm going to have to go to confession. <laughs> because it won't be no time and I'm going to be in the flesh and I'm going to get it all wrong. So, Lord, you take care of it. I can't. I've got enemies, but, Lord, I give them to you. Paul said in 2 Timothy 2.24, the servant of the Lord must not strive. God has, God has rebuked me a number of times with that verse. Servant of the Lord can't argue. Get out of it. They, people start arguing, get out of it. The servant of the Lord can't go there. Other people can, you can't. If you're a child of God, get out of it. If you're already arguing, you're already in trouble. Get out of it. I'm going to trust God to deal with this. Number two, he says, I will not lose hope. Look at verse 5. For thou art my hope, O Lord God. Verse 14, what does he say? He repeats it. I will trust hope in the Lord. How long? Continually. Continually. Meaning that even at his age, I still am going to hope in God, and I'm going to hope, and I'm going to hope, and I'm going to hope, and I'm never going to quit hoping. Continually hope in God. I read a quote in a little book called uh, Come Before Winter by Chuck Swindoll that it, the whole chapter I read, there was one, one little line, I just, I just circled it. It was great. Let me quote it to you. It says, If tears were indelible ink instead of clear fluid, all of us would be stained for life. Think about that. Let me read that again. If tears were indelible ink instead of clear fluid, all of us would be stained for life. Let me ask you, what keeps you pressing on? Why did you not throw in the towel and give up? What makes you persevere? Well, I can tell you it's not because life's easy. It's not because you've got to get out a trouble-free card and you use that and you, it makes you exempt of any problems in life. No, it's because you hope in Christ and you hope for a better day and you hope for the one day the Lord is going to make things right and you hope that someday God's going to win and we know it will happen because He said it's going to happen and we hope against hope. Not because life's easy and we never have problems. We hope because of Jesus Christ. And in Him we live and move and have our being. David said back here in Psalm 37, 25, I've been young and now I'm old, and yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. Rob and I have been married for 41 years. Been in ministry for 35 years. 
Good plus. I can tell you, and she can too, God is faithful. I have seen some worst times, and I've seen some best times. I've seen incredible things. God is faithful. Stories that we could tell you of how God works in the behalf of his people. I remember one time, and, and the Lord reminded me of this, when I was working at Eberhardt Coal Company on that drag line, and the operator, they'd hired me on as an oiler, and he eventually, he broke me in on the machine, and he retired, and I ran that machine. But um, that was a very hard and dark period of my life, where, where if it could go wrong, it went wrong. It's like the devil met me every morning I got out of bed, and he just went to work with me every day there for a long period of time. Lord had called me into the ministry and I'm trying to make house payments and pay bills and keep the old truck fixed and, and begin school and do it all. They're telling Robin and I, oh, you need to sell the house and go to Indiana Wesleyan and, and uh, go to school and we ain't got two nickels to rub together. And I don't know how I'm going to do it, but there was a program with the district. They offered classes at the district office in Columbus, Ohio, and I could go down on the weekends and start taking classes. And I remember that I signed up in faith. But during that time, the coal mine was running almost seven days a week. And therefore, in the wintertime, we did. But uh, we were at six days a week, and the classes were on Saturday. But I went ahead and stepped out in faith and said, God, go and do this. I don't know how. So I said something to the operator. I said, you know, I need to start taking Saturdays off. I've just been hired. He said, what do you mean? And he was mean and cantankerous, and, and, and he was a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I mean, he cussed horribly. He had anger management issues. He threw anything that he could get his hands on. When he was mad, he just started throwing stuff. And you just better get out of the way. He was about three times my size and ornery as all get out. And when I broke the news to him and said, I need to start taking Saturdays off to start taking classes for the ministry. Even though he went to church every Sunday, he just unloaded on me and said, you're going to get fired and I'm going to make sure it happens. He said, you can't be doing that. Well, I backed up and I, and I said, Lord, I don't, know, I don't know how this is going to happen. You called me to the ministry and I need to start going to school. And, and, and how is this all going to happen? And, and I needed to talk to the owner of the mine about it. And, and he came out later that week. And I really prayed and I got some other people praying. And this guy is just, I mean, he's just on a roll. He's furious. Every day he's mad at me and uh, carrying on and cussing and, and screaming and ranting and raving about why did I even apply for a job there if I can't show up for work? I know he's right. Maybe I need to find another job. Jobs are hard to find right there. There, there was no work. I mean, if you had a job, you didn't dare quit it. The boss showed up, and they talked around a little bit, and I brought it up, and I said, Phil, there's some classes I'd like to start taking, and uh, they're offered on Saturday, and i got to drive to Columbus two and a half hours one way, you know, for an all-day class and then come back and they're on Saturdays and I need to start going to school. He said, what's it for? I said, it's for the ministry. And he looked at me like I had just stepped in from another planet. <laughs> and I'm just waiting at any time the operator here to just, I'm going to get fired, I know it. And he spoke up and he said to the owner of the mine, he said, you know, if we work five, ten-hour days, he could go to school on Saturday. I could have the weekend off. He said, I think I'd like that. He said, how about if we just, instead of working five days, eight hours, he said, how about if we just work five tens? And if we need to work later in the week, he said, during the week, he said, we can do that. The owner of the mine said, I believe that would be all right. <laughs> <laughs> and my jaw just about hit the dirt right there. I'm like, wow. You see, folks, when you take your problems and you give them to Jesus and you take your enemies that you think are your enemies and you give them to Jesus, it's amazing what God can do. In and of ourselves, all we're going to do is muddy the water and make it worse. God knows we have need of before you even ask. There's a poem that I cut out and I thought, man, I'm already out of time. called Keeping On. It, it, on my desk, I, I cut this out years ago, and it's, it's 
I've got a big desk calendar in my study there at home, and, and under the glass top, it's, it's there. And I see this on a regular basis. I don't remember when I found it, but here it is. It's called Keeping On. It says, I've dreamed many dreams that never came true. I've seen them vanish at dawn. But I've realized enough of my dreams, thank God, to make me want to dream on. I've prayed many prayers when no answer came. I've waited, patient and long. But enough have come of my prayers to make me keep praying on. I've trusted many a friend who failed and left me to weep alone. But I've found enough of my friend's true blue to make me keep trusting on. I've sown many seeds that fell by the way for the birds to feed upon. But I've held enough golden sheaves in my hand to make me keep sowing on. I've drained the cup of disappointment and pain. I've gone many days without song. But I've sipped enough nectar from the rose of life to make me want to live on. David said, Lord, don't let me get off the path of righteousness. Don't let me get confused. Don't let me lose my way. Don't let me get confused or confounded. Keep me in the center of your will. Keep me going on. In verse 16 he says what? I will go in the strength of my Lord. Now I don't, I've got more to, I've got, that's about half the sermon, but I'm going to quit because I'm out of time. In your hymnal, if you get it out, page 600. The Lord gave me this song this morning, and I don't know who it's for, but somebody here, it's for you. Page 600. I'm going to ask you to get your hymnal out. I'm going to ask you to stand. Musicians come back to the instruments. Art, I'm going to ask you to lead us there where you're at. 600. Page 600 in your hymnal. You know it. If you'd like to pray this morning, if... if if there's a need in your heart, there's something going on in your life, and you'd like to come and pray, you feel free to do so. This is your altar. This is your time. Let's all stand. Or would you lead us? Page 600. If you'd like to come and pray, God is waiting.
this this morning for the Word of God in front of us and for the way, Lord, you're calling us closer and closer that we might be like Jesus. Father, help us in the world we live in to not get confused about what it means to follow Jesus. Help us to not take our cues from the media. Help us not take our cues from anybody but your Word. And your spirit, Father, may we get in step with you and pick up the cross and follow Jesus. Help us, Lord, with our enemies. Help us, Lord, to know how to be Christ-like and loving in a world that hates us. God, help us to not get in the flesh, for we battle not against the flesh, but, Father, help us to walk in the spirit. Help us, Lord, in our decision-making. Help us, Lord, in all that we do, and help us to go in your strength because, Lord, it's all about you, and that's all that matters. Now, Father, be with Tammy. You know her needs. You know her heart, and I just pray, God, you answer her prayer. Father, she empties her heart and gives it to you, Lord, right now. Father, we just pray in the name of Jesus that uh, you just finish whatever work you're doing. And Father, in our own hearts ourselves, as we bow before you where we stand, we say, Lord, finish the work in our heart too. Amen. And Father, you know what needs to change that we might be like Jesus. Amen. God, we just simply say, Lord, we're yours, and we follow you, and we do so in the name of Jesus. We love you, Lord, and we trust you for all things, and we are waiting for you to come back. So, Father, until then, we're yours. And we pray that in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you for being here today. If you give me just a second, I'll meet you at the door and uh, greet one another with a holy bump. And, uh, you know, until, until we can hug next, that's all we got. So, God bless you for being here today. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>